What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the March 26th Tuesday edition of the Stochastic NHL Strategy Show. I'm your host, Josh Harris. Somehow, we still have three and a half weeks of the season. Somehow. Um, And somehow, one of the most important games of the season is Detroit Red Wings and Washington Capitals on this slate. How did we get this far? How did we get this far? Joining me, as always, Slim Cliffy. What's going on? How was your weekend? Oh, pretty good weekend. Um, you know, until the hockey season finishes, still not a uh, whole too, uh, too, too much going on. Um, spent the last couple few days watching the Los Angeles Kings. I'm still not sold on them being the team that they were in the first, like, 25, 30 games of the season. But they are playing really good defense, and Cam Talbot looks like the goalie that he was in the first third of the season. And that should be a little bit terrifying for the opposition. It looks like they're probably going to get Edmonton in the first round. Um, I don't think that's a very good matchup for Los Angeles. I don't think that's a very good matchup for anybody. But, um, you know, if Cam Talbot keeps putting up the numbers that he's been putting up basically since the All-Star break, it's a much different team than it was around Christmas uh, or January, but uh, Kings are not on the slate tonight. We do have 12 games, pretty big injury news uh, come, uh, coming, you know, in the first game that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Boston and Florida. Um, really big injury news uh, there. That's going to be pretty important. But other than that, seems like a somewhat quiet slate. And I say that hesitantly coming off the heels <laughs> of the DraftKings Fantasy World Championships on Sunday night. And I don't mean to laugh because a lot of people got screwed out of the potential for a lot of money uh, with those late scratches from Braden Point and Victor Hedman. It's the second year in a row that this has happened, that DraftKings has had the Fantasy World Championship on a Sunday night with a pile of teams on a back-to-back. I'm hoping that they learn their lesson. I feel pretty confident saying that they won't. I just wish that they'd do something different because that it's it's honestly ridiculous that um, you you have absolutely no indication that a player won't play and all of a sudden um, you know a, an eight thousand dollar fifty goal scoring center is just not playing. So um, I really hope they fix that for next season. We'll see what happens. Well, first of all, it's a quarter million to first, their biggest one ever. There was no publicity of it. I didn't even know it was Sunday until you said something to me or someone in the chat said something to me. Having it on a Sunday is fucking ridiculous. Half the slate was on a back-to-back. There's never news on Sunday. And not only did they say there was no late swap, they didn't turn it off. So you could swap. (laughs) And if you made a swap, I guess like they DQ'd you or something. And they said someone got on the mic and said, please don't swap. Instead of just turning it off, just like absolute garbage from DraftKings, absolute poppycock. I just want to—I've wanted to say poppycock for like, like three months now, and that—that that fits my agenda. So absolute poppycock or shit from DraftKings. But what can you do? I'm not surprised. Are you surprised? Are they going to learn? No, it's—it's no. it's not um, surprising, and they won't learn a lesson from it. That, like that—that's what—that's what makes this—that's what makes this so frustrating and so insane. I'm glad I wasn't in it. Like I would have, I would have gone absolutely nuclear on them, like seeing what the slate was. But um, a lot of people are more calm than I am, and thankful for that because <laughs> there was no incident apparently uh, at the at the at the World Championships. But uh, that was last weekend. We got twelve games to get to here tonight. Yeah, yeah. They've been doing the NBA final on Saturdays and then the DraftKings final on Sundays, which is just really stupid. Because when I was in the final in 2020, they had it a different weekend in a different city. Now they're just getting cheap and they just load everybody into the one spot. But anyway, I digress. We'll meet with DraftKings over the summer and it won't make a fucking difference. Just wanted to thank you guys for uh, the affiliate signups, the super chats and all that. Baseball season's coming up. Uh, you can go through the link in the chat to sign up for baseball. We have Sims. We have data packages. I'm trying to see if there's going to be some kind of promo. We can get you some money off on a trial run or something like that. I think maybe that goes live tomorrow. Uh, I will let you guys know in the chat on Twitter. I'll tweet out something. And uh, if you're interested in playing MLB DFS, go through the link. 
We really do appreciate it. It supports us directly. And uh, it lets you get free shows from us where you can just make fun of me. And I know you guys like to do that. So there you go. Let's start with the Boston Bruins heading into Florida. The Bruins have a 2.8. The Panthers have a 3.1. What was the injury news you were talking about? Because <laughs> Oh, no. Barkov's back. Oh, Barkov's um, back. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, I was like, look at the lines. And I was like, yeah, he's hmm. on the top line with Tarasenko. And uh, well, I guess it's top line, but top line with Tarasenko and Evan Rodriguez. Yeah, I was looking for someone to be out and I was very confused. But yeah, Teres, or, uh, excuse me, Barkov is back with Tarasenko and Evan Rodriguez. Not really sure why they made that a line, but I don't know. Kachuk for Hagee Bennett together. And then the third line is Ryan Hartland, Del Oosterein. I guess it's because when Barkov was out those three games, Barkov or uh, Reinhardt, Lundell, Lusteran, and played well. I would imagine that changes fairly quickly. Um, well, it, and I know it, it's it's different coaches, but Lundell and Reinhardt a couple of years ago when Mason Marshman was still there were probably the best third line in the league. And yeah. when you're coming into the playoffs, like you don't need three lines. Colorado proved that a couple of years ago uh, when they won the cup. You don't need three lines to win the cup, but have, being able to go three lines deep, three good scoring lines deep is really, really helpful, especially when you're facing teams like Carolina or the Rangers or something like that. So I can see why they're doing it. I don't think it necessarily helps from a DFS pers perspective, and that's all that really matters for us. Yeah, and it definitely hurts that top line defensively. <laughs> Uh, having Tarasenko up there. Uh, yeah, I, there's not a ton of ownership in this game. There's a couple lines in the 2%, Barkov being one of them, Boston 1 being one of them, and the Bennett line. This is this is honestly an MME-type uh, game for me. Like, th all these lines are reasonably priced, 18-9 for the Kachuk line. That's probably the line I'd want to play the most in single entry. Um that being said, there are a lot of lines in that price range that are in better matchups. Like, this isn't the best matchup going up against Boston. Now, I, I understand that the Bruce Coyle and Marshan are okay, and it's a good matchup for Florida, too. But, like, you have you have the Rangers in good matchups around that price. You have Dallas has, like, three lines that are cheaper. There's just a whole bunch of lines in better matchups than Florida, too. Now, are they a good play? Sure. Yeah, you can play them. I just don't think I'm going to prioritize them on this slate. It's a 12-game slate. I want to get a line with a comparable salary in a better matchup. You know what I mean? In MME, I think it's perfectly fine. You want to have someone with Florida 1. I think that's perfectly fine. I think Boston 1 is fine, especially now that uh, uh, Tarasenko is on the top line and not you know Verhage or, or Reinhardt. Put Tarasenko up there, it's going to hurt them a lot defensively, and they're going to see a, a fair bit of that Pasternak matchup. Uh, I think you can play Boston one. It's more of an MME 20 max type deal for me. But, you know, David Pasternak one off, always in play. But for me, my favorite line is Florida two, and it is still a 20 max type deal for me. Yeah, I, I you know, first off, I I did have interest in Boston until we got the news that Barkoff is coming back. And now with Barkoff mm -hmm. back, uh, Gustav Forsling also back in the lineup, which That's is pretty big for them. He's yeah. their number three defenseman, and a number three defenseman on a cup contender is a really good defenseman. So um, don't have as, that much interest in Boston. Like we always say, like a pass and act one off or, or something like that. Uh, it's perfectly fine, but um, it is the Florida side that I'm more interested. I think I'm a little bit higher on Florida too uh, than you are. Uh, I don't mind them at all in just about any type of contest here tonight. Like they're not getting uh, much ownership at all because of the matchup. Um, uh, two point, sorry, two point one percent ownership on that Kachuk Verhage Bennett line, eighteen thousand nine hundred. Um, they're still producing well. I was looking since the All Star break. They're at three point two expected goals, three point one actual goals per sixty minutes. Kachuk isn't shooting a ton. Still at 3.3 shots per game, which is good enough, like, in that span. Like, that's not great, but it's good enough. And, like, you know, Verhage's playmaking has gotten better uh, throughout the season. And he's a guy that's – he's on a little – he's been on a little bit of a cold streak the last few weeks, but could easily still end up with a 35-goal season. I'm not super concerned about the matchups on the Boston side either. Uh, 
they're not bad defensively or anything like that. In fact, as you and I always say, like this is probably their optimal line of configuration from a defensive perspective, but it's not something like this isn't the 2021 Boston Bruins or, or anything like that. Like uh, there's still not a lot of concern in that regard. And, you know, there are other lines in that price range. I agree with you. Like, we'll we'll talk about them later. Like maybe the Rangers or Dallas or something like that, that you might rather play. But I think this line is right up there with them. Like they are exceptionally good and you get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit and Florida has been drawing a lot of power play opportunities at 4.3 power play oppor- or minor penalties drawn per game since the all-star break. That is a lot. Um, the league average is at about 3.3 and they're only second behind the Calgary flames. So I do like Florida two here tonight there. They are a line I'll, I'll be considering in just about any type of format. But I think that's the only line that I have a lot of interest in here. Yeah, I. the reason why I think it's a little bit more of an MME type play for me is because in the next game, the Rangers and Aaron line has an unreal matchup. But, like, we've been Florida two donkeys for, like, three seasons now. So, like, we're always on that train. I think it's fine. I just I think I prefer the Rangers second line a little bit more, and let's get to that game, and I'll talk. I'll tell you why. Philadelphia Flyers with a two point four total heading into New York. The Rangers have a three point two, and no, it's not because I'm a giant homer. I'm one of the least homer Rangers fans. I I think I think I I could be wrong, but anyway. Rangers line status quo. Flyers going Tippett, Konechny, Frost, Faraby, Lawton, Brink. Forrester, Paling, Hathaway, Couturier, Cates, Lixell. <laughs> Torts. Uh, the reason why I like the Rangers' second line more than Florida, too, for two reasons. One, they're coming in at 3.2% ownership, which is right around what Florida, too, is. But they're only 19-3. We've seen them in the mid-21s at, point, at points this season. Lafreniere is producing. Trocek and Panarin on the top power play. They've been great all season long. They're going to see a lot of that Lawton Brink Farabee matchup, and they are so bad that I just I would prefer them going in like I would prefer Trocheck going into the Lawton matchup than you know uh, Bennett going into the uh, what am I saying the uh, Coil matchup it. I mean, like, the coil line isn't great defensively, don't get me wrong. It's just that that Lawton line with Farabee and Brink have been brutal. Now, it could last, like, three shifts, and Torts can completely go blender. But it's it's a much better power play spot than it was, like, six weeks ago. It's still not a great power play spot, but it's the goaltending that's let them down. And if the goaltending is going to let you down, the Rangers' power play can take advantage of that there. The Rangers' second line has been producing five on five all season, so I'm I, I do like Rangers' second line. I think the Rangers' top line is okay. They're coming in with a little bit more ownership than the Panarin line, so I would defer to the Panarin line. Um, on the on the Flyer side, I don't have a ton of interest, but if I did, it would be Frost, Konechny, Tippett. The Zabanajan line with Rosvik there is high event as Cliffy noted during that trade when they traded for him. So I think you can definitely play some tip of Konechny Frost in MME at 16.9. I think that's a good price for them. The Rangers goal goal against numbers still aren't great. It's just Sturkin that's, you know, saved their, their behind. It's been the Rangers goalie saving their behind since 1994. It's different coaches, same, same problem. But for me, it's Rangers two, uh, Flyers one. Yeah, I will say the only thing that kind of worries me is that they don't end up um, going up against the lot line is that they actually do end up going up uh, against Konechny, Tippett, and Frost. And the Travis Konechny lines have typically been pretty good defensively this season. I think the bigger point, though, is Philadelphia has been taking a lot of penalties and it's gone... I, I don't want to say unnoticed. I'm sure the Philly, uh, I'm sure the Philly fans and and beat writers have been talking about it. But uh, the Flyers are at 3.8 minor penalties per game over the last six weeks. It's a uh, span of 19 games for them. It's the fourth highest or fifth highest rate in the league. Sorry, fourth highest 
on this slate and the Rangers have been drawing more power play opportunities. So, and the, the Flyers PK is not what it was back earlier in the season. I think injuries are probably part of it. I think goaltending is certainly part of it as well. Um, this is not a super elite PK up there with Carolina or even Florida at times. Uh, this has been more towards the middle of the league for a couple months now. So, uh, I, I agree with you on the Rangers second line. Um, I really do like Panera and Trocek Lafreniere because they are relatively cheap at 19,300. They're still scoring a ton, 4.3 goals per 60 uh, in the month of March. Trotek, 22 points in his last 20 games over three shots per game. Like this is not a line where you leave one guy off or, or something like that. You just stack the three of them. I have them, uh, like in all honesty, in my own numbers, I have them slightly ahead of Florida too because it is a better matchup uh, against the Flyers than it is against Florida or against Boston. Sorry. But um, I think they're pretty much neck and neck. And uh, like, I don't, there is, it isn't a big, big enough of an edge for me to say one way or another, but they are two of my favorite uh, lines on the slate um, in that, you know, 19 to K ish range. So I really do like Rangers too. I think there is some merit to playing the flyer side here because frost tip and connect me have been really, really, really good this season. Whenever they've been able to play together, 3.4 expected goals, an absurd actual goal scoring rate, largely because of shooting percentage, but they are creating a lot of offense when they're on the ice. They're under 17 K they're getting positive leverage per the top stacks tool, perfectly correlated on the power play as well. Not that the power play is ever very good, but uh, perfect <laughs> correlation is better than none. I think there is some merit to play Tippett, Connect Me, and Frost here tonight, but it, I, I agree with you. Like this is a game about the Panarin line, and they are one of my favorite lines on the entire slate. Yeah, I mean, like Panarin's probably going to be in the top five of the hard voting, and like to get that line at that price when they've been twenty five percent more expensive at times this season, it's kind of hard pass up but it is a big slate so we might carolina hurricanes with a 3.4 total heading into pittsburgh the penguins have a 2.6 jake gensel back in pittsburgh that always happens fast when you get traded to a team um that line gensel aho jarvis twenty thousand two hundred. it's a little bit still expensive you know gensel's price is still really expensive for 17 18 minutes at least he's been getting 17 18 minutes you know what i mean he did get over 20 one night. This is, is, is his return to Pittsburgh, but like he's been ridiculous since he's gotten to that line. That line has been producing like crazy. It's weird. Cause like they're doubling their expected goals. Their actual goals are like double their expected, but like that's kind of a line that you would expect that. You know what I mean? I, I, I think they kind of, they kind of like break the expected goals model a little bit there. Because, you know, Jarvis is the best thing to ever come out of the 2020 draft class. And, and you know, Ajo is a very good center and Gensel is an elite player. Um, that being said, they're coming in under 2% owned tonight. And they have a – I know they're on the road. It's 3.4 road total. But, like, they have a pretty advantageous matchup at 5-on-5. Five five. Crosby, Rust, and O'Connor, they, they have a decent sample. Like, it's 75-ish minutes. 3.1 expected goals against per 60. Like, that's not surprising. It's, like, similar to the Zibanejad line with Roslovic, you know? Like, Rust was never really, really good defensively. Raquel was the guy who would kind of stabilize that line defensively, but you throw an offensive player up there like Drew O'Connor, they're, they're going to be high event. So I do really like Carolina 1 here. The price is a bit annoying for the minutes they play, but they've been really efficient lately. So, like, I don't know if I'm going to play them in single entry, but they're definitely a line I have circled on this slate. If they were the price of the Panarin line even, I would be a lot more happy about playing them. Just 20200 for 17, 18 minutes worries me. You want to go to Svechnikov, Netchis, Kuznetsov because of that? I think that's fine. I, it's, you know, I prefer Carolina 1. I think, you know, the depth of Car – like, it's just a minutes thing with Carolina. They just spread out the minutes so much that I'd rather get 17-18 out of Gensel Ajo Jarvis than, like, 14-15 out of the second line or third line or 
even the fourth line plays like 12, 13 minutes. So I, I think it would be Carolina one for me. On the Pittsburgh side, I don't have a, a much interest in single entry. In MME, if you happen to get to a little bit of, you know, like a one-off Malkin or a one-off Crosby, like that stuff doesn't really interest me that much. But if it, if it gets into your crunch, it's fine. Like I think the happiest thing I would be with Pittsburgh is like a one-off bunting because he shoots. But like I just don't have a ton of interest in Pittsburgh here tonight. Yeah, me neither. Um, certainly, MME pit one I think is perfectly fine. Like single entry, I don't think there's uh, a whole lot of a need to get, to get to the Pittsburgh side here. It is the Carolina side I'm interested in. I did write up the Carolina top line in the picks article today. This is a line I have right there with Florida two and Rangers two. Um, they are the most more expensive one. They are coming in with the least ownership of the three because of it. Uh, minutes, you I, like, I agree with you. Minutes are a concern. Um, they are perfectly correlated on the power play, which is obviously uh, something that you, you want anytime you're paying $20,000 plus uh, for a line on DraftKings. The other thing is, as you mentioned, the top line just hasn't been good defensively. And it, it, it like, if you look at the top line with Crosby and Russ, it honestly hasn't mattered. Like, even with Raquel there, the defensive numbers, like, they were better, but still not good by any stretch. Like, this, the Crosby-Russ duo, it has been the definition of trading chances back and forth uh, this season. And if you're going to trade chances back and forth with a gensel Aho jarvis line, I feel like you're going to come come up short uh, more often than not. I do like Carolina one here, just flat out. But like I said, the problem is, is, I have them ranked like them, Florida two and Rangers two are basically right next to each other in my rankings. And if you look at uh, the top stacks tool, they're not that far uh, separated uh, by top stacks percentage either. You have the Carolina one line at 8.7%, the Panarin line at 8% and the Kachuk for Hagee Bennett line at 6.7%. They aren't that different. The Carolina top line is the, is the highest top two probability, and that's it's reflected in the price. When they're all fairly similar, I will almost always defer to the team that's at home. So it'd be Rangers or Florida, and usually to the line that's cheaper. Now Florida and the Rangers are, are basically within are within four hundred dollars of each other, so they're basically even. So I don't think that matters, but they're all fairly low owned as well, right? Like. You know, this Carolina line's at 1.6%. The Rangers uh, under 4%. Florida, two at 2%. Like, you're not really getting a whole lot of ownership savings for how expensive they are. Like, that's just kind of my issue with Carolina. If I was 20 maxing, I would certainly have some Carolina one. If I was 150, obviously, you're going to have some. And I'd pro- I would, this is a line I would come in over the field on if I was 150 maxing. I do like them here tonight. That's why I wrote them up in the picks article. I just think there are other lines in that price range that you can play that I are cheaper that I would, that are at home that I would rather play like in single entry. That's just kind of my whole point. Yeah, I completely agree. If they were the price of the Panera online, it'd be a much more interesting conversation. But like you can use, if you use that 1500 responsibly or, or well, it's going to benefit you a lot, especially because like, you know Kachuk is going to play over 20 minutes. You know Panarin is going to get his minutes. You don't know what Aho and Gensler are going to play. They could play 16 minutes here tonight. You just don't know. Detroit Red Wings with a 2.9 total. Heading into Washington, the Capitals have a 3.1 total. This is an extremely important game for playoff implications in the East. And we have our first stamp of the night. This game sucks. Like, I can't, like, one of these teams is probably going to make the East playoffs. And, like, this is ugly. These lines are ugly. Perron with Larkin and Raymond. To bring Cat with Confer and Kane. Like, the samples on these lines are disgustingly bad for for Detroit. Like, they're bad. And it makes me want to play Washington. But the samples on their lines aren't great. So what, what do you do here, right? Washington has a pretty decent penalty kill. Detroit is not doesn't have the best penalty kill. Now, Ovechkin has kind of come alive a little bit here. His numbers with his numbers with McMichael this season haven't been great. But he's on a line with McMichael and Oshie. 
Ovechkin plays the full two minutes on the power play. So he's going to get power play time with McMichael. He's going to get power play one time with Oshie. Detroit's penalty kill isn't great. There's a little bit of negative leverage on them. Nothing egregious to the point where I'm like, holy crap, do I have to fade Chalk Washington here? Like I, As much as I hate always playing the Capitals, and I do, like I've been a historical cap fader, I honestly don't mind the Caps top line here, Ovechkin, Oshie, McMichael, just because of the power play time. And they're going to see a fair bit of that Larkin, Raymond, Perron line, which has been just awful together. I don't know why they're still pumping Perron up there. Like anyone but Perron on that line, and I'd probably be interested in that Detroit one line. So I'm interested in the Washington one line. I think the, the Strom line's okay. Like you want to leave off McMichael and Adam Strom for a power play one stack. I think you can do that. I, I think Strom, Protoss, uh, Miro Shashenko at 11,800 is okay as a filler. Obviously, most fillers have negative leverage, this not being an exception. They have negative leverage here and i think that's okay but i want to try to get as many power play guys as i can so that'd be washington one if i was going to play a line on detroit it would be kane to bring cat confer and i really just don't want to play a confer line and these power play units suck the even strength lines suck so i think i'm out on the wings i'm out on both teams i mean i'm not stacking anything from either team here like i just Alex Ovechkin is projecting extremely well, um, and he's been on an absolute tear. So, like, playing Ovi, I think, is perfectly fine. Um, if you want to play, like, a cheat TJ Oshie or something, I, obviously that's fine as well. I wrote a Patrick Kane in the Picks article, article mainly because Washington's penalty kill is basic, has not been very good since the All-Star break. And since Kane got to Detroit, he leads the team in points per minute on the power play. And that unit... Even though they're split, that unit is – like, they have been better without Dylan Larkin. And if you look at uh, shots, expected goals, actual goals, they're all better without Dylan Larkin. So, like, I don't even hate that they're split away from him on the power play. So, I don't mind, like, a one-off Patrick Kane, uh, one-off the Brinkat. You want a one-off Lucas Raymond. He doesn't shoot very much. Uh, it's it's kind of a tough – it's kind of a uh, – uh, it's a thin, you know, a very thin line between uh, value and not with him uh, because he doesn't shoot. But I just don't have an interest in stacking anything here. I think like this, this game kind of screams to me like, like three, two. And, you know, maybe somebody has a goal and an assist. Maybe OV gets like an, a, an empty netter and has a two goal game. That's why I, I really do like Ovechkin as, as a one off here tonight. And like, I like Patrick Kane as a one off here tonight. I just don't like the idea of stacking anything from either side. Yeah. Stamp it. This game sucks. <laughs> it's a poor game, but it sucks. Sign up using the link in the chat to get access to the best NHL data and tools in the industry. Get player and ownership projections, top stacks tools, line combinations, and access to the premium Discord. Um, there are three and a half weeks left in the season, so uh, a monthly membership would get you through that. It would also start you off in the playoffs, which... Uh, is a fun time to play NHL DFS. First round is excellent. I think we're going to have content. I'm not 100% sure on that. We haven't really discussed it. So, but we might. Um, we might not. We'll let you know. But uh, there are good GPPs for the first round of the of the playoffs. So a monthly membership would get you through through that. So just click the link in the chat and uh, sign up. And so you came from the show. New Jersey Devils with a three total heading into Toronto. The Maple Leafs have a 3.5 total. There's a lot of ownership in this game on both sides. And uh, I don't know if it's, I mean, like I get it. Both these teams are bad defensively. They don't have the best goaltending. I just don't know if I want to play a 12.9% projected Tavares line, a 10% projected Matthews line. You know what I mean? Like maybe the Matthews line, just because like Bertuzzi and Domi, like Domi's a good offensive player. I think if I was, if, oh, excuse me, if I, what am I doing? If I was going to play a Toronto line, I think it would be the Matthews Bertuzzi Domi line. Just 
Matthews has been unreal all season. Domi's a good offensive player. Bertuzzi doesn't hurt you, right? They have positive leverage. So does so does the Nylander line, but I'm going to go with the best player, and that's Matthews, and go about my day. New Jersey side is a little bit more interesting to me because I know their total's lower, and they're on the road, but I just got no faith in the Leafs here. Um, you want to go to the Heisher Brat, uh, Heisher Brat Meyer line? They've been excellent. They're still over four expected goals per sixty, and the sample's up to 110 minutes. I, I think like they're fine at 18 2 or excuse me, 18 6, but it's one of those things where I'd rather play the Rangers second line. I'd rather play the Florida second line. So, like, and they're going to see Matthews. So, not that that's anything like because Domi's there, but no, they've been using Tavares hmm. in a shutdown role since Domi got there. That makes sense. So, you know. I think they're fine, but I'd rather play the Rangers' second line. Hughes, Hall, and Holtz is interesting to me at 15-8. I don't have a lot of love for uh, for Eric Hall, but since that line's been together, it's a small sample. They've been very, very well. Uh, they've played very, very well together. Uh, the issue is Holtz has, you know, got benched after scoring a goal, which is just bananas. Hughes didn't skate this morning, but he's expected to play. I think, you know, New Jersey one's fine. I think maybe like a Hughes Holtz two man is something that I do. Like, I just don't love the ownership in this game. I think I'd side to the Matthews line, but I think New Jersey's firmly in play. Yeah, I I would probably defer to the Matthews line. One, because they like they have been legitimately good um, offensively uh, with Domi there. Now, a lot of it is shooting percentage related. Like this team is on a pretty good shooting percentage bender over the last, you know, five, six games. Um, but they have been legitimately um, creating good offense. They are going to avoid the his year line um, because they aren't getting the shutdown matchups anymore. So that's more good news. I, I do like Toronto one. I honestly think I'm more interested in the New Jersey side and it's just an ownership thing. I suspect that the Matthews the Matthews line is going to carry a lot of ownership, especially in in single entry contest. New Jersey won Hisher, Brat, and Meyer. Like I'm not super concerned about the matchup against the Tavares line um, because Tavares uh, Tavares and Nylander really don't have like elite defensive numbers. It's basically like league average, and league average is something that never scares me away from playing really good lines. And as you mentioned, that New Jersey top line has been really, really good. I kind of like New Jersey, too, a little bit better here tonight. Um, not that I have them projected for more points. Like, obviously, I have the top line projected for more points, um, mainly because of Eric Alla and, and Alex Holtz playing, like, 11 minutes. Um, but they are going to see more of that Matthews Domi line. And, and whatever we think of, of them offensively, things aren't good defensively. Like Max Domi is just a really bad defensive player. He is one of the worst in the league. Like, I don't know what else to say. And um, Hughes is still generating a ton of shots, not finishing a ton, which has been a problem basically all season, but they are generating pretty well. Um, Holtz and Hughes, just the two of them, they're at 3.3 expected goals per 60 minutes at five on five. Wrote up Holtz in the pick art, picks article. He's second on the team in five-on-five five goals this season. The only player with more is Dawson Mercer, and Mercer has one more goal. Um, they've been really, really good at five-on-five. Five. The least power or penalty kill has been starting to come around over the last few weeks. I wonder how much um, the defense or the defense kind of has to do with that. I think more of it is just Samsonov hasn't been as bad as he was in the first half of the season. So. Um, I'm more interested in the five on five matchup. And for me, that means New Jersey two here tonight. And they don't really have a lot of ownership of 5.6%, 4.1% top two stack percentage. Um, New Jersey two and the Matthews line in that matchup. I like both sides here. Fair enough. Vegas Golden Knights with a 2.8 total heading into Nashville. The Predators have a 3.3 total. Vegas beat the Blues in overtime last night, two to one. Uh, Thompson went last night and Aiden Hills hurt. So there's a good chance it's going to be Yuri Patera here tonight. They could go back to Thompson. Uh, I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, um, I don't have a ton of interest in this game. 
I think Nashville one is an interesting uh, MME GPP play at 19.6. They're coming in at 1.5% projected ownership. Petrangelo is still out. There isn't really a line that concerns me from a defensive perspective on Vegas. Like they're probably going to see Eichel, Stevenson, Amadio, and um, that doesn't really scare me. Fairly correlated on the power play. Vegas's penalty kill hasn't been great. It has been better since the trade deadline. I think Nashville one is a sneaky MME type play, but at 19 and six, again, like it's Rangers two, Florida two. I have both teams that I above them and it's just hard to prioritize Nashville one in single entry. Um, when you have a cheaper line and better spot, but I, I do like Nashville one here tonight on the Vegas side. I don't have a ton of interest. I think if you know, you want a filler there, they're kind of a little bit more expensive than the filler at 13.8, but Roy Barbershop, Marcia, so would be the line. And again, that's more of an MME type deal for me. I don't have a lot of interest in stacking either side here. Um, the big reason I, I don't really have interest in Nashville is that Vegas just doesn't take penalties. Um, they're at 2.4 minor penalties per game over the last six weeks. That's been something that's been basically around that number for months now. Um, frequently the least penalized team in the league. And if you look at Nashville now, you know, Forsberg is Forsberg. He's done real well regardless, but Ryan O'Reilly has gotten, excuse me, geez, 23 of his 58 points on the power play. That's 40% of his points on the power play. He's also gotten 60% of his goals on the power play. This is a line that needs to succeed on the power play to not to just score, but to be a DFS winning lineup or, you know, three man unit, they need to get there on the power play at least once, if not twice. And against a team that you might not get more than two power plays against and whose power play, whose penalty kill has not really been great, but has been getting a little bit better. Um, I just don't think it's, it's really an ideal matchup for Nashville, like in a single entry now when obviously 150 max or something, that's a completely different story, but, I agree with you. Single entry, not a lot of interest there. On the Vegas side, I have no interest in this in these line combinations. Like none. I just don't. Um, next game. <laughs> like, next I'm, game I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't like. Um, I'll I'll just hold off until until they change lines again or until guys start getting healthy. Got the stamp ready. Uh, Edmonton Oilers with a three point one total heading into Winnipeg. The Jets have a two point nine. Edmonton won, obviously the most expensive on the night. McDavid, Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, 23-4, coming in at 0.9% ownership. It's just it's just not a good matchup. McDavid is matchup proof. Like, but going into Winnipeg is probably outside of Carolina the toughest place to go and play. In single entry, I'm fading them. I think a lot of people are, but a 0.9% ownership in MME, not hard to get above the field. And like if I was 150 maxing, I, I think having like four to 6% Edmonton one here is, is, you know, completely viable. They can destroy anybody at any time. So I'm fine with that, but in single entry, I'm fading and just hope it's a normal game going into Winnipeg, just a, a tough matchup. On the Jets side, again, like until Velarde comes back, I don't have a ton of interest in that top line. That second line is really the third line based off minutes. I would have interest in that second line if they played 15, 16 minutes. They just don't. So I'm I'm probably out on this game completely. Yeah, I don't have a lot of interest in the Edmonton side in a single entry. Again, uh, another one of those things, like if you're 150 maxing, obviously you're going to have some. Edmonton top line, since the All-Star break, 4.2 expected goals, 5.1 actual goals. Like They've just been keeping that train rolling, which is why they keep going back to that line. I don't have a lot of faith that Edmonton's going to keep these line combinations because they keep they keep moving around Leon Dreisaitl because they're trying to figure out their second and third lines as they head into the playoffs. I don't have a lot of faith that they're – that you know. It's one nothing Winnipeg early in the second period and dry and dry back on the top line. Like that's just kind of the problem that I'm running into here. So yeah, I don't have a lot of interest uh, in the Edmonton side. Uh, and like 
I know Winnipeg's been on a little bit of a slide. Their slide uh, since March 1st includes being top 10 by goals against per 60 minutes. Like, the, like they set the, buy, the bar so high for goals against that even being a, a top 10 team by goals against is considered bad for them. Like, this is how bad of a matchup it is for Edmonton. So, yeah, um, no interest on the Edmonton side. On the Winnipeg side, a little bit of interest into Foley, Ehlers, and Monaghan. The main reason is Ehlers and Monaghan have actually – found ways to score. They're 3.7 goals per 60 minutes together in 180 minutes. A shooting under 12%. You get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. Like, I hear you about uh, ice time. But, like, Monaghan, you know, over 17 minutes in three straight games. Like, Toffoli hasn't been getting a ton of minutes. But he's been, like, pretty consistently around – 15 to 17 minutes in his last few games as well. And like, he wasn't getting a ton in New Jersey anyways. He was at 17 and a half minutes. Like that's not a lot of ice time. Um, and they're going to get a lot of that uh, Leon dry sidle matchup. And that dry sidle line just really not been that good defensively. Maybe Adam Henrique will help. Um, I have a little bit of interest in Winnipeg too. I just think, again, there are just in single entry, there are other lines in that price range I'd rather play. I think that for me, it, it'd be Edmonton 1, Winnipeg 2, but it's more for MME than it is uh, for single entry. Just, you know, maybe some one-offs, but that's about it. Fair enough. <clears throat> Calgary Flames with a 3.3 total. Heading into Chicago, the Blackhawks have a 2.7. This is an interesting one. Um. From both sides, because Chicago moved Donato back up to the top line, and Connor Bedard's best numbers this season have been with Donato. And it's also interesting from a Calgary side, because it really depends who you think the Dickinson line is going to take. Who do you think they're going to take? Like, do you think they're going to go up against Backlund? Yeah. 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 That was my thought as well, which kind of frees up our boys, Kadri Zari possible. So, and like, they've been getting decent minutes since Zari came back. Like, Zari and his two games back both got 16. Possible still has gotten 14. Possible at times is getting like nine. And Kadri plays a ton. So, I uh, don't mind going back to Kadri Zari possible still here. They'll probably see a bit of the Bedard line. And like, that's fine. Or if they see like Felino, like, that's, great you know what i mean so like i don't mind kadri zari pasta so as much as it pains me i don't even mind sharing gover chuberdo kuzmanko just because they're gonna avoid the dickinson line for the most part and they've actually been okay together they're fully correlated on the power play whatever that means for you um i prefer kadri zari pasta so they've just been better but like the sharon gover chuberdo kuzmanko line actually has been okay on the Chicago side, if Donato's with Bedard, it does interest me a little bit. I don't know if I would prioritize them or even play them in single entry, but they are circled on my list. They might get cut early, but, you know, Bedard, Kershev, Donato, not the best numbers, but they're better than with Flino up there or Tyler Johnson up there. Donato shoots, and that's kind of good for DFS. 15-8, I don't love. But, you know, if in MME, I think it's fine. I think they're going to be a fairly early cut for me in single entry, but they're at least circled. So I think my favorite line in this game is Kadri Zari Bospisil. Yeah, I do like the Bedar line here tonight um, for two reasons. One, Calgary's defense just really hasn't been that good um other than the oddly enough other than the sharon govich huberto uh kuzmeco line like the other lines have not been good defensively um and calgary has been taking a lot of penalties 4.1 minor penalties taken uh per game since the all-star break that is third in the league and third on the slate behind anaheim and florida chicago you know, we talk about it often, their power play, as long as, you know, everybody's healthy and in the lineup has really has been good this season. Um, you can thank Connor Bedard for that. Now, Calgary's penalty kill has honestly not been that bad, um, even without Lynn Holman, without Tanev and all those guys. Like, it really hasn't. 
but they are taking a lot of penalties. And it's one of those situations where even if it's a good penalty kill, if you're going to give up like four or five power plays to Chicago here, all they need is one. And, you know, at 15,800, they get another goal at five on five. And all of a sudden you're really in business. Um, Bedard and Donato together this season, 190 minutes, 2.8 expected goals for 3.7 actual goals for per 60. So the power play has been good. Donato's not on, probably not on the top power play unit, but, um, Bedard and Kershev are. So you get two out of the three on the top power play unit. As you mentioned, Donato shoots. He can actually produce as well. Um, I do like Chicago one year tonight, just flat out. And I like them better. You know, we talked about Winnipeg too. I think they're 16,300. I like them better than Winnipeg by a whole lot. On the Calgary side, like, I I think I'm with you on going to Kadri Zari Pospisil, mainly because of the ice time. But... Um, I do want to shout out Sharon Govich, Huberdeau, and Kuzmenko because, as you said, they really honestly have not been that bad. 2.7 expected goals for one and a half against per 60 minutes. They're all in the top power play unit. They don't get a lot of ice time. 16, 17 minutes, I think, is the best that you can hope for. But at 13,800 on DK, you don't need a ton of ice time either. This is another line that really only needs two goals, and you're, and you're really in business. So, um, I think there are multiple playable lines on, on the Calgary side. I probably would go with the line that's perfectly correlated on the power play. That's Sharon Govich, Huberto, and Kuzmenko. But my favorite line in this game is the Bedard line. And it always scares me whenever my favorite line in the Chicago game is from the Chicago side. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, that does make me nervous. Um, but, you know, Bedard and Donato have good numbers together. And then, you know, Donato is going to be on the fourth line next game for sure. Uh, before we continue, we have a $4.20 super chat from Hypno Toad. There's a shocker from the Toad. Thanks for everything, fellas. Heart Hypno Toad. Good to hear from you. Uh, hope your pursuit of your midlife crisis of becoming a goalie again is going well, but good to hear from you. Yeah, thanks uh, for the super chat. It is good to hear from you. Hope uh, you remember to stretch and stretch well before you get uh, back into the net. But uh, thanks and uh, hope to see you in chat a little bit more often. Yep. Montreal Canadiens with a 2.3 total heading into Colorado. The Avs have a 4.1. I don't know what Daily Faceoff is doing with their lines. Daily Faceoff has McKinnon, Lekin, and Druen, Ranton, and Nishushkin, Middlestat. Cliffy went and looked. It, those lines lasted like five shifts. And we both agree that we highly doubt that they're going to break up McKinnon and Randon at this point. We are project our Cliffy and I are projecting Randon, McKinnon, Druen, and then middle stat Lekin and Nishushkin. Druen and Nishushkin could flip flop, but like generally, um, Bed Jared Bedner likes Nishushkin on the second line. So McKinnon, Ranton, and Druen, and then Lekin and Nishushkin middle stat. The top line would be 22 7. It is a very, very good power play matchup. And that's the thing, right? So if you if you think it's going to be, if you put in Ranton and McKinnon and Druen, and it's Nishushkin up there, at least Druen's still on the top power play. If you can't make the swap to Nishushkin, you get the power play correlation. This is one of the better power play spots on the night. McKinnon is just ridiculous. He's 10-5, which is nice to see because he should be like 11-7 re realistically. But like <clears throat> McKinnon, Ranton, and Juran, probably my favorite line of the night. Um, there's nothing really to say about that. I think Montreal 2 is in a very good spot as well. Middle stat, Lekin, and Nishushkin, if that is the line. You know, New Hook, Armia have been pretty good offensively this season. Defensively, no. Like once you get past the Caulfield line, which is maybe league average defensively, it just falls off a cliff. So like if you want to play the second line of middle stat, Nishushkin Lekinen, I think that can be a very, very good line because middle stat's an unbelievable playmaker. Nishushkin and Lekinen are very good players. So the thing is like I, I just want to prioritize the power play guys. It, it, it would be – you'd have to thread the needle to play Colorado 2 without McKinnon and hope – that you still get there, you know what I mean? So I'd lean towards Colorado 1, Colorado power play, but I, I think Colorado 2 is viable. On the Montreal side, it is Justice the new one in that he actually has been decent 
But if you get to Caulfield, Suzuki, Slavkovsky in MME, I'd leave it. I know it's a 2.3 total, but it's fairly highly concentrated towards the top of that lineup. So if, if you did happen to get like four, five of 150, Montreal won, I'm good with it. But this is about Colorado and their power play tonight. Yeah, I really don't have a lot of interest in Montreal here. Um, the top line has been good. They do rely a lot on the power play for their success. They're kind of like Nashville in that sense, where the top guys really need power play, the power play to come through to to find success. Because, you know, Suzuki and Slavkovsky just do not shoot a lot like Caulfield does. But if he doesn't get the shot bonus, then you're, rel you're relying strictly on points for everybody. And if you're relying strictly on points for everybody, you need the power play. Colorado's at 2.9 minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. It's like the seventh fewest in the league. Like they're taking less than teams like Washington and Pittsburgh, which is normally have not taken a lot of penalties this season. So Colorado's playing pretty disciplined hockey. And if Montreal's not drawing a lot of power plays, I think the top line's kind of boned here. So yeah, single entry or single entry, I have no interest. Multi-entry, yes, of course. Yeah, you'd have to consider them, but uh, not a whole lot for me for Montreal. Alex Newhook revenge factor, maybe. I'm not playing Alex Newhook. Uh, it's a Colorado one game for me, like by far. Um, they are my favorite line on the entire slate. I don't think it's that shocking because, um, <laughs> you know, they are incredibly expensive. They are at home. Um, the only line that's more expensive is Edmonton, and they're on the road against Winnipeg. So, <laughs> yes, um, Colorado's top line does great uh, out better for me. Since January 1st, that top line with Drew and Ranton in there, 3.4 expected goals, 4.3 actual goals per 60 minutes. And as you mentioned, they're all in the top power play unit. Montreal still taking uh, penalties at a, at a rate way above the league average. We know how good Colorado's power play can be. I wrote up Nathan McKinnon in the picks article today. I actually didn't realize, like I knew he was shooting a lot. Once you see how much he's been shooting, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, what I wrote about was that they had a six game road trip coming out of the all-star break. And since that road trip, 33 points in 16 games, it's 6.1 shots per game. Like Chandler Stevenson might not get that in a month. <laughs> McKinnon is putting up 6.1 shots every every game since that road trip. It's absolutely insane. Uh, Montreal's penalty kill is still very bad. Uh, this is like Colorado one is is grading out as my uh, top line on the entire slate. Colorado one, even with Arturi Lekin in there, was the top was the top stat, uh, top line in the top two stacks. That'll only go up when Miko Rantanen is added instead. I really, really like Colorado one here tonight. Yeah, we just got a top stack run. I just reloaded. And McKinnon, Ranton, and Drew N, 31.2% top two stack, 16.2% projected ownership. That sounds about right. Yeah. I don't think that's egregious either. So yeah. I, I do really like Colorado here. Let's talk about some chalk. Columbus Blue Jackets, they 2.9 total. Heading into Arizona, the Coyotes have a 3.6. Two of the highest owned lines in the night are both on the Arizona side here. Keller, Schmaltz, Bukestad, 14.2% projected ownership. And Genther, Kraus, Cooley, 12.7% uh, projected ownership. Now, I think they're both in very, very good matchups. I think if I had the salary, if like, Money wasn't an issue. I would go to Keller, Schmaltz, Bukestad. Uh, I just think they're better. They're in a good matchup. And, you know, if I had the 15-7. If I didn't, I'm completely fine with Genther, Kraus, and Cooley. They have been very, very good. Um, Genther has been great since he's gotten called up. Kraus has had another good season. Cooley, I wish he shot more for DFS, but beggars can't be choosers at 12-7. Um, push comes to shove, I prefer Arizona 1 here. Uh, but if you can't fit them with the line you're going to, I don't mind playing Arizona 2 here. On the Columbus side, I honestly don't mind the Jenner, Nylander, Goudreau line. Um, like, I'm just going to – they've been very, very good offensively. 
I should jump in here. Um, they did. Okay. They're doing morning skate while we were on the show. Um, Alex Nylander was not on the ice for morning skate. Um, Alex Texier was on the top line, and they moved Pythia to Pythi- Pythia Pythia. I forget which one it is uh, to the second line in Texier's place. So it sounds like Nylander is going to be out then. Yeah, scratch that. <laughs> I don't know how Texier is going to really do on that top line. I just. You know, I'm a Texier slappy, but I just don't think he's going to fit in very well on that top line. So, I mean, he he is twenty six hundred dollars cheaper uh, than Nylander. So, yeah, so that line like is kind that. of thirteen four. So yeah, yeah, like maybe you can take a flyer on them, but like at thirteen four. But at that point, I'd rather just save the extra seven hundred and go to Genther Kraus Cooley. Um, you know. It's fine MME play, but honestly, it's an Arizona game for me, and the ownership does worry me. But there's plenty of ways to get different on this monster slate. Yeah, so the thing that I'm kind of wondering about with the Columbus side, because I do want to talk about Columbus first just because they are the lower-owned side. Um, They played Saturday in Vegas. They lost Saturday in Vegas. The top power play unit was the old top line with Kirill Marchenko. Now, if Nylander's out, does Tessier go to the top line, top power play unit? Because I know they had been using Cole Sillinger at times. And the reason I bring that up is because if Cole Sillinger is on the top power play unit, all of a sudden that second line has two out of the three guys on the top power play for Columbus. And Arizona's penalty kill has been abysmal. And they do take a lot of penalties. Now, we don't know. We're kind of guessing what the power – I mean, for all we know, they're just going to put another defenseman there like they have been doing and yeah, go with awkward. a 3 Come on down. Yeah, exactly. Go with a 3-4, 2 defenseman power play instead. Um, it would give me some interest in Columbus, too. They are coming in with a lot of ownership, and we don't have any confirmation. Like, I'm, we're just guessing at, at who could make the jump to the top power play. Like, that's kind of the problem here. Maybe they just use Texier and just say, you know what, plug in on the top line, plug in on the top power play unit. We just don't know. Um, I don't mind Columbus one here. Thing is, is um, even though they're a lot cheaper, I think there are just other filler lines in that price range. Like, we talked about Calgary. I'd probably rather play Calgary going into Chicago than I would rather play Columbus going into Arizona. Um, we'll talk about Dallas a little bit later. There are some cheap Dallas lines. There are certainly cheap lines in the next game we're going to talk about, Anaheim, Seattle. So, like, there are just other cheap lines that I'd rather go to. For me, I agree with you. This is an Arizona one game. I did write up Arizona in the picks article. Uh, when I wrote them up, they were the only line priced under 16000 uh, on DraftKings that had um, a top two stack probability over 4.6% and they were at 7%. Like that's kind of the reason why you'd want to stack them is because they are a mid price line that is far and away the most likely to end up a top two stack here tonight. Yes, they're going to carry a lot of ownership. That's why um, they have the high top two stack probability um, It's because of the matchup and they have the high ownership because of that high top two stack probability. But um they have been scoring like that was the big thing with this top line the entire season is with Hayton there they weren't scoring with Cooley there they weren't scoring with Kerfoot there they weren't scoring now with Bukestad there they finally are they're at like 3.3 goals per 60 minutes or something with Bukestad in between them so I do like Arizona one here great five on five matchup good power play matchup um Arizona won for me in this game. I have some, I would have interest in Columbus too if we had more confirmation on what the power play lines look like. Yeah. Anaheim Duckies with a 2.3 total heading into Seattle. The Kraken have a 3.2. Let me just see if we have the updated Seattle lines here. We uh, do. While, while you're looking at that, um, Trevor Zegers back for Anaheim tonight. Going in on the third line with Brett Leeson and Isaac Lundestrom. Oh, um, let me just pull up the Seattle lines real quick because I don't think they're accurate. They are. Let me just see here. Let me find them. Tolvin Engineers, Bjorkstrand, uh, Schwartz, McCann, Everly. Yeah. 
why is Cartier up on? Yeah, we have Cartier on the Beniers line for some reason. Cartier is on the fourth line with Van Morrison and Winterton. Um, I don't know that that Bjorkstrand Beniers line kind of interests me a little bit here Tol- with Tolvanen. There's not going to be a sample. But they're probably going to be fully correlated, and the Ducks take a ton of penalties, and their penalty kill sucks. Now, they're probably going to see a fair bit of ownership because the McCann Everlay Schwartz line in top stacks has 8.8% projected ownership. I would imagine when Cartier switches for Tolvanen, that's going to go up because, I mean, the price is going to go up a little bit, but. I would suspect their top two and their ownership takes a little bit of a bump there, but Yorkshire and Beniers told them would be the line for me. Uh, you want to play McCann, Everly Schwartz, go ahead. Like I, I prefer the Beniers line on the duck side. Like this is just a bad matchup. Like Seattle's just boringly good on defense. So I'm out on the ducks. Yeah, no interest in the Anaheim side either. Um, maybe once they get in a better matchup and they don't have Trevor Zegers on the third line, uh, we'll see. But the Vetrano line is just not generating generating anything. The Carlson line has just been not been able to score all season. This isn't this doesn't seem like the matchup that they just finally I mean people probably thought the same thing in Montreal on Sunday, and look what happened. Montreal put up five goals, but um it, I don't think so. Seattle is a side that I'm more interested in. It is the top line because they were perfectly correlated uh, from the power play in the last game. And they've actually been getting like 60 to 65% of the power play time, which is something that almost never happens with Seattle. They're almost between, they're almost always between 15 and 55%. You talk about all the penalties Anaheim's been taking 4.9 minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks, most in the league. Um, them in Florida are kind of in a league of their own. Um, Anaheim has been one of the most penalized teams basically all season giving up over a power play goal against per game, which is absolutely insane when you think about it. Um, not that Seattle's power play is any good, but that line is only what, I think like 13,700. So they are one of those like fillery type lines you can put in with those 19, 20 K lines that we've talked about earlier in the show. So I don't mind Seattle one here as a filler. That's all I like from this game. <laughs> yeah. Same. Um, let's talk about the sharks to end our night. Yay. Dallas Stars, the 4.1 total. Heading into San Jose, the Sharks have a 2.3 while we were on the air. Uh, the coach announced that Sagan's going to be out just in a rest game from after coming back from injury, which kind of sucks because I was kind of interested in that line. Um, they were 14-7. Now it's, for me, it's, it's Johnston, Stankov, and Ben just going right back there, 15-7, and calling it a day. You want to play Dallas one here? Go ahead. But like, I'm taking the savings and going to uh, Johnston, Stankov, and Ben on the Shark side. Jake, our, our boss, Jake Hari, for some reason, um, isn't a bromance with Michael Gramlin. He's for some reason projected higher than Wyatt Johnston. You need to stop that, Jake. Seek professional help, please. Thank you. I'm out on the Sharks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get why it, you know, he does play a ton of minutes. The offense honestly hasn't been that bad. Uh, a lot of it has been because the power play has honestly been fairly good over the last couple months. Um, this isn't a good power play spot. It's Dallas is at 2.8 minor penalties per game over the last six weeks. Uh, sixth fewest in the league, fourth lowest on the slate here tonight. Um, penalty kill has generally been like generally been good um whenever the goaltending hasn't let them down uh, i was looking like just like recently recently so like since the um since january 1st um fourth fewest shots against per 60 minutes but the gold t- 750 goaltending <laughs> on the penalty kill is kind of killing them so it's like uh wedgewood save a puck or two if you could here tonight but, but yeah no interest in san jose and that's san jose second line <laughs> god uh, Luke Cunning, uh, playing, <laughs> playing with Alex Barabanov and probably Philip Zadina because Zadina was back on the ice. Um, they're at 40% of the expected goal shared together this season. They're getting absolutely throttled whenever they're together. And that's the matchup that Wyatt Johnston is going to get. 
I really do like the Johnston line uh, here tonight. I wrote up Johnston in the picks article. Uh, obviously, him and Stank Oven and Ben have been really good since Stank Oven got called up. Only 2.1% ownership on that line, 2.3% top two stack percentage. Uh, I just really like that matchup for them. Both at five on five, they're not perfectly correlated on the power play, but they do get, they all get reasonable power play time because they do split the units uh, fairly equally. So I really like um, Johnson, Stank, Oven, Ben. If you want to go to the Dallas top line, I don't really have an issue with it. I don't have an issue playing anybody against the San Jose Sharks. This is one of the worst teams in modern NHL history, but I don't, I would probably prefer to just go with the savings because they're all going to play relatively the same amount of minutes. And I'll go Johnson, Stank, Oven, and Ben for this game. The the, the Sam Steele hat trick tonight is going to be great. Um, I don't even know if he's in the lineup, but it's probably viable. Coming up after us at 5 p.m. NBA Deeper Dive with Josh Engelman and DK DFS. 6 p.m. Eastern NBA Live Before Lock with Greg and Eric. And then 7 p.m. the playback live stream NBA watch along. I think that's usually with Greg and um, Josh Angleton. So stay tuned for that if you're playing NBA. Yes, Gabagoo. Stanky Leg is on the second power play, especially now with Sagan out. He is 100% going to be there. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about defensemen here. Top of the board, we have Makar and Yossi at above 8K, and then everyone else is under 7K, Bouchard, Wegar, Wierenski, Carlson, Jones, Morrissey. Like, obviously, if McCarr is an unbelievable spot, I think Yossi's kind of in a sneaky good spot. Like, McCarr is easily my number one, but, like, I don't know if I'm going to be spending up for defensemen here uh, tonight, especially with the way I am trying to build in my head while we're talking on the show. I'm trying to, like, jam in lines in my head and my calculator spitting out errors, the calculator in my head. Um, don't, don't ask, don't, it's just a mess. Who are you liking? Um, yeah, Makar is at the top of my list as well. Uh, Wierenski honestly not that far behind. Uh, I think I agree with Yossi. It's kind of sneaky. Again, it just worries me that it's a pretty bad power play spot for Nashville. Um, that's just kind of my concern. I think both Mackenzie Weegar and Seth Jones are fine here tonight playing each other, uh, in that game, especially like I, I can obviously we'll see what happens. I can just kind of envision like we are just like trying to <laughs> go end to end as often as he can and gets that terrible Chicago team just because he can do it. Um, so I don't mind. We are here tonight. Mid price range. There's a lot of interesting names. Like I wrote up Adam Fox, like with all the injuries that the Rangers have on the blue line, um, Adam Fox might get a lot more ice time again here tonight. Uh, Thomas Harley, really good matchup against San Jose. It's kind of like, same thing with Weegar. I just kind of see him like dancing all over San Jose's grave here. Um, don't mind Mike Matheson for Montreal. He just plays a ton of minutes in Colorado, like does, does play at a very high pace. It seems like a good uh, matchup for him to rack up peripherals um, on DraftKings. Miro Manoff is really starting to get expensive, but not a bad uh, matchup for him. And I'll mention more at Cedar. Um, he just plays in all phases and could rack up peripherals in what is a tough matchup. But I think Fox and Harley or even Haskinen um, are kind of in a league uh, of their own in that mid price range for cheaper guys. I wrote up Jolts, uh, Justin Schultz with Evans and Dunn both out for Seattle. Schultz is the only defenseman left that can run a power play. So he's going to get um, the top power play time for sure. Ryan McDonough is projecting extremely well at Stochastic, so uh, don't mind him uh, in that sub-4K range. And Jamie Alexiak, for the same reasons as Justin Schultz, except without the power play, but Dunn and, and Evans are out, so Alexiak is going to have to play minutes, and it's a really good matchup against Anaheim. Mentioned Braden Schneider from the Rangers. Uh, if you need a kind of a punty-type defenseman at 2,800, Mike Kesselring, I think I'll mention him just about every show until he either does something or the season ends uh, 2,800 uh, for Arizona uh, getting uh, reasonable minutes. Not a whole lot in that super cheap price range that I absolutely love here tonight. You know, Jalen Chatfield, I think is kind of in play. He doesn't play a ton of minutes, but it's not a bad matchup uh, against Pittsburgh. That's basically it. Like there's just not a lot in that super cheap price range. Price range um, that I like here tonight. Braden Schneider uh, certainly uh, near the top of the list. 
Yeah, I, I was looking for names um, towards the bottom and like there really wasn't anything like someone just said White Cloud's min salary on Fandle. He's pretty much min salary on DraftKings. He has been playing, you know, 17, 18 minutes with Petrangelo out. I guess that's fine. Um, Erho Vakanainen at 2,600. He played 20 minutes the other night. He usually doesn't live in that range, but, like, he doesn't really do much with the ice time. He's kind of like a Walmart Mikey Anderson. So, I don't know. There's Yeah, sorry. But <laughs> there's really not much down there, so I, I kind of agree with you. It's not a pepperoni tattoo. When I get it finished, I'll do a sh- I'll do a solo show shirtless, so Cl- I don't have to. So Cliffy doesn't have to deal with that. Um, <laughs> no problem. Let's talk about goalies. Um, premium on my OnlyFans, by the way. Um, goalies tonight. I think you know if I'm spending up Joey Decord's fine. I don't love it. I think Igor Shesterkin would be the guy I would, I would uh, pay up for at 8,200. Um, UC Saros, I think, is okay at AK as well. Even with Barkov back, uh, I think Swayman's okay. Hellebuck at home is always fine. Edmonton does worry me a little bit. And if I'm spending down, it's Mrazek that I have circled. Yeah, I wrote up Swayman in the article. That was before we got the Barkov news. I think he's still fine, but I didn't like him. I don't. One of the reasons was because no Barkov hurts the hurt Florida power Florida's power play a lot, and it's the power play that worries me. Um, whenever you play the Panthers, but he's still fine. He'll st- he's still projecting well for his price, but um, not as high on him. Igor is the guy that I like in that expensive price range. Um, both goalies in Calgary, Chicago, are grading well for me. That kind of worries me because it's Calgary and Chicago. <laughs> you know what I mean? Feels like one of those teams is going to score five and the other team is going to score one or none. And uh, trying to decide which is going to be which is is kind of a crapshoot. But um, with Markstrom as expensive as he is, I'd probably lean to Mrazic and just save the $1,000. So I don't mind Mrazic for cheap here tonight. Um, also mentioned Carl Vimelka. Um, he's expensive at 8 k the thing is, is Arizona only really gets into trouble when the penalty kill is is letting them down, and I'm not that worried about the Columbus power play. So if you want to avoid what I think might be a somewhat chalky Shesterkin, although like chalk goalies I don't really worry about, um, I think the Melka at 8K is fine as well. Do you have any interest in the Duck starter? Because, no. you know, Seattle penalty or power play isn't that great. No. I don't Just know if I'll play a Ducks goalie for the rest of the season. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to like create something like Montembeau under 7K would be frightful. Blackwood, I don't have interest in. So, like, yeah, I think the cheapest I'm going is. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would, I would rather play, I would rather play Blackwood than either of the Anaheim goalies. Yeah, that's fair. Um, who are you liking for your hat trick pick? Speaking of Seattle, why not Oliver Bjorkstrand? I think you got a, a Seattle hat trick pick right last year too. I don't yeah, know why that. I think it was Burkowski. Yeah. <sighs> going. Going Clayton Keller. Just I don't know. I like Arizona here tonight. But yeah, we will be back on Thursday because tomorrow there's like a half a game before. Like there's there's like less than one game tomorrow, the day before MLB starts, and then there's then there's MLB on Thursday, NCAA tournament is back, and NHL schedule fourteen games. Sure, Gary. Sure. Oh, that reminds me, we're gonna be here an hour earlier on Thursday because there is an MLB live before lock in our normal time slot, so we will be here one p or either twelve forty five or one p.m. Uh, Eastern on Thursday, so. If you're looking for us, we will be a bit early. We'll tweet something out. Um, But, yeah, good luck, everybody, tonight, and we'll see you early on Thursday. Good luck tonight, everybody.